Hello, I'm Bethany Tucker, genetic counselor with Sanford Imaginetics. Hi, I'm Gabe Kringlin. I'm a pediatric genetic counselor with Sanford and Fargo. And today we're here to talk to you about genetic testing, particularly in the context of a condition known as familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH. Let's start by talking about what cholesterol is. It's a waxy, fat-like substance. Yuck! While it might sound gross, our bodies need cholesterol to grow and function properly. Our bodies are made of lots and lots of cells. As you can see in this left-hand slide, there's a cell and each cell has a membrane. Cholesterol is a necessary component of cell membranes. Cholesterol is also used to make vitamin D, some hormones, and bile acids. In the picture on the right, you can see that most cholesterol is produced by the liver, but it can also be found in some of the foods we eat. When is cholesterol too high? Total cholesterol is made of three different components, high density lipoprotein or HDL cholesterol, low density lipoprotein or LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. The LDL cholesterol, also known as bad cholesterol, should be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. When it's too high, several factors may be contributing. Some of these factors, namely diet and exercise, are within our control. Some factors, such as age, gender, and genetics, are not. Some cases of high cholesterol are genetic. Familial hypercholesterolemia is a genetic condition that causes high cholesterol in the blood. We will use the terms FH and familial hypercholesterolemia interchangeably throughout this talk. Because familial hypercholesterolemia is genetic, it can be passed down from one generation to the next. FH accounts for about 2% of all people with high cholesterol and can be seen in a roughly 1 in 200 to 1 in 500 individuals in the general population. What happens for people with familial hypercholesterolemia? People with FH have a high cholesterol level starting at a young age, even in childhood. This can lead to atherosclerosis, uh, hardening of the arteries and narrowing of the arteries, and an increased risk for heart attacks or strokes at a young age. For example, men with untreated familial hypercholesterolemia have a 50% risk for a heart attack or stroke by age 50. For women with untreated FH, there is a 30% risk for a heart attack or stroke by age 60. Many people with FH will not have any recognizable physical features, but when the condition is untreated, some findings may be detected by medical providers trained to recognize them. This slide shows you some of the physical features of FH. Xanthomas are yellowish patches of cholesterol buildup in certain areas. At the eyelids, they're called xanthelasmas. At the elbow and Achilles tendon, xanthomas. Individuals with familial hypercholesterolemia can have a ring at the corneal margin known as arcus cornealis. This finding can also be present in individuals as they age, so it may not be considered diagnostic in and of itself. Medical providers can use formal clinical criteria to determine who has a diagnosis of FH or is likely to have uh, the condition. Some of the factors that increase a person's risk for FH include persistently elevated LDL levels. And here you can see in adults we're talking about LDL levels greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter and in children levels that are greater than 130 milligrams per deciliter. In addition, individuals with a personal or family history of premature coronary artery disease are at increased risk for FH. Uh, finally, if there's physical exam findings present, these are all factors that can help alert patients and providers that additional discussions and possibly testing are warranted. Now let's have an example from Jen Leonard sharing a case in which the medical and family histories help bring a patient's condition to light. Hi, I'm Jennifer Leonard, genetic counselor at Sanford Health. My case example for familial hypercholesterolemia began when a woman was referred to me during a pregnancy for genetic counseling. The reason for the referral was because a screening test had flagged the pregnancy at high risk for Down syndrome and prompted the option to come to me to talk about what the test result meant for the pregnancy, what additional options she had, as well as any recommendations I would make not only based on this test result, but from the family health history that I take during my appointment. When taking that family history, I noted her paternal grandfather. So the grandfather on her dad's side had passed away from a heart attack at age 33. 
Her father was 32 when he had had his first heart attack and he has had multiple issues since. He's also had a history of high cholesterol and she remembered that he did take multiple medications for this. And so when taking that family history, I noted that there was a family history of sudden cardiac death under the age of 50. There was a family history of early coronary artery disease in men under the age of 45. And I was seeing this in successive generations affect on the same side of the family. Meaning I was seeing the family members who were affected all along that same bloodline. And these red flags prompted me to be concerned for this patient and to dig more into her own personal history as well. In doing so, I was able to note that she has had cholesterol testing based on the family history. When I had spoken to her, they did note a significantly high cholesterol for her age, and this had continued to be the case even after I met with her. When talking with her, there had been no genetic testing completed in the family. After speaking with the patient, talking about the options, she did decide to proceed to not only help herself, but help other family members as well. When the result came back, we in fact did find she had a gene mutation known to be associated with familial hypercholesterolemia. And so when we're talking about genes and we're talking about mutations, what we're talking about is the DNA. It's found in each and every one of our cells and is passed on from our parents. It's the genetic code that tells our bodies how to form and function and sections of that DNA are referred to as genes. When we're talking about mutation, what we're talking about is a change in the DNA sequence or a genetic variant. And the reason this is so important is because if a person has a genetic mutation or a genetic variant, there may be medical management recommendations or screenings that we would make for them because of the differences in their DNA that may impact their health. You can think about the DNA as a recipe. So imagine a recipe for chocolate chip cookies. And if you get that recipe and it mistakenly left out the chocolate chips, when you would make cookies, they would still be cookies, but obviously they would be without the chocolate chips. Or what if there was a mutation that made it to where instead of it saying chocolate chips, it said raisins, so you end up making raisin cookies. This is something that, again, while it's still making a cookie, the cookie is different. This would be the same for the human body. And the reason this is so important to know is because a change can impact how we provide health care for an individual. We look at the information for individuals with familial hypercholesterolemia and no mutation status, you can actually see a significant difference in their cholesterol that significantly impacts their health and well-being if we know this information and can screen them appropriately. So what I would like to do now is talk about genetics and genetic testing, specifically in the context of familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH. So while we have approximately 20,000 total genes in the human body, there's currently four known genes to be associated with FH. These genes are LDLR, APOB, PCSK9, and LDLRAP1. Of these genes, LDLR changes are by far the most common genetic cause of FH. I should also point out that changes within LDLR, APOB, and PCSK9 are dominantly inherited, meaning that only one gene change is needed to be affected with FH. LDLR AP1 gene changes are recessive, meaning that two gene changes, one from mom and one from dad, are needed to be affected. For purposes of this discussion, FH should be thought of as a dominant genetic condition as LDLRAP1 associated FH is extremely uncommon. Another thing you may notice is that if you look at these numbers, you may notice that they do not all add up to 100%. One reason for this is that there are probably other genes associated with FH that we just haven't found yet. More on this later. And just to make sure that everyone is familiar with the ideas of dominant inheritance and recessive inheritance, here are just two images that help illustrate these two ideas. So you can see on the left with dominant inheritance, if one parent is affected with a condition such as FH, each of their children will have a 50% chance of inheriting that same genetic change and being affected themselves. Whereas with recessive inheritance, two genetic changes are needed to be affected, one inherited from mother and one inherited from father. So that two parents that are carriers for the same recessive genetic condition um, will have a 25% chance of having an affected child with each pregnancy. I think this next image really shows how all of these genes work together to make proteins that help regulate and remove LDL or bad cholesterol from the bloodstream. I'll first direct you to the 
yellow spheres that are floating out in this, outside the surface of the cell, in this case, a liver cell. Um, these yellow balls actually represent um, LDL cholesterol or bad cholesterol. The next structure I'll direct your attention to are these um, orange-colored Y-shaped structures that lie at the surface of the liver cell. And these are actually the LDL receptor proteins that help um, recycle um, the LDL cholesterol from the bloodstream. The red stripes that are on each yellow LDL particle actually represent ApoB protein. And essentially the function of this protein is to help LDL-R, um, the receptor, bind the um, LDL cholesterol efficiently so that it can be recycled. Next, um, you'll see the multicolored proteins that are floating uh, throughout the extracellular space known as PCSK9. These are proteins that actually um, help degrade and recycle the LDL receptors. Um, so if these uh, proteins are actually working too quickly um, or doing their job too efficiently, that can also cause FH as it basically results in fewer LDL receptors on the surface of the liver cell. And then finally, you'll see next to each orange Y-shaped structure are the LDLRAP1 proteins. And these are little structures that help position the LDL receptors to the correct location on uh, the surface of the liver cell. As far as genetic testing goes for FH, there are many different laboratories that offer panels that include LDLR, APOB, PCSK9, and LDLRAP1. For people with a clinical diagnosis of FH, only approximately 60 to 80 percent of individuals will have a positive result identified by genetic testing. Patients that meet clinical criteria who have negative genetic testing might have negative results for a couple different reasons. One reason might be that they have a mutation in a gene that's yet to be identified. Another possible reason to explain negative results of genetic testing in a patient with a positive clinical diagnosis is that there might be um, other more complex causes such as polygenic FH where somebody has many different genetic factors and environmental factors that are each small individually but work together synergistically to cause somebody to have a high cholesterol level in a family history. As far as genetic testing goes, there are several benefits for genetic testing in the context of FH. Um, one, having a mutation confirms one's diagnosis of FH and clarifies their lifetime risk of coronary artery disease. Having a mutation is associated on average with a three times higher risk of coronary artery disease compared to not having a mutation. And this is true within any given category of LDL level. Two, if we find a causative mutation for an individual, we can use that information to screen his or her children, siblings, parents, or other relatives. This idea is often referred to as cascade testing. The relatives found to have the same mutation will also be diagnosed with FH, while relatives that do not will typically not be at increased risk of coronary artery disease, and they can therefore breathe easy knowing that their family history risk does not in fact apply to them. Three, genetic testing may increase treatment compliance. Studies have shown that once a person finds out about having an FH causing mutation, they are actually much more likely to comply with treatments such as changing diet and exercise habits and taking cholesterol lowering medication. For patients that have a mutation, no amount of diet and exercise will be sufficient to bring LDL levels to an acceptable healthy level. These individuals need some sort of medication, such as statins, to help control LDL levels. For patients that don't have a mutation, perhaps starting with diet and exercise alone could be ideal. Finally, there may be a psychological benefit to having a diagnosis of FH confirmed by genetic testing. So, for example, rather than feeling guilty about having high cholesterol, these patients can breathe a sigh of relief since they now know that they are not doing anything wrong. They have a genetic change that is not their fault. Now, there are some limitations of genetic testing in the context of FH. One is cost. So cost is dependent on a number of different factors. Insurance providers vary widely in terms of whether or not they will cover the cost of genetic testing. But in cases where insurance does not cover the cost, out-of-pocket costs are typically in the range of $200 to $400. Another limitation of genetic testing is that results may be inconclusive. So while some genetic changes are clearly associated with FH, other changes have uncertain effects on cholesterol levels where we're not actually sure if the change that we're seeing is actually the cause of somebody's personal and family history of high cholesterol. 
In genetics terminology, we call these types of results variants or changes of uncertain significance, represented by the yellow triangle shown in this figure. Finally, some people won't get answers for their personal and family history of high cholesterol. Again, only about 60 to 80 percent of these individuals will have a positive result on genetic testing. In these cases where we don't find a clear answer on genetic testing, we are not able to clarify a person's diagnosis of FH, nor are we able to use this information to test other at-risk relatives. Now I want to move on to talk about some general public health issues surrounding the diagnosis of FH. A 2013 study in a U.S. population found that the median age at initiation of lipid-lowering therapy was 39 years and the median age at diagnosis of FH was even later than that, was 47 years. And again, I'll highlight that these are people that actually are diagnosed eventually with FH. Less than 10% of those with FH in the U.S. have been diagnosed. New guidelines were recently published in 2018 by the American College of Cardiology, which recommend genetic testing be standard of care for patients with a confirmed or suspected diagnosis of FH based on clinical criteria. Quotes from my colleagues in pediatric cardiology in Fargo really help um, illustrate the importance of identifying FH, particularly in a pediatric population, and they read as follows. We agree with the American College of Cardiology statement from 2018 mentioned below, given the potential benefits of risk reduction for coronary artery disease with early intervention and or treatment. Given the current prevalence of heterozygous FH, Early testing in childhood will identify patients who would benefit from early medical treatment. With both untreated homozygous and heterozygous FH, coronary artery disease presents much earlier, 12 and a half years and 35 years respectively. So really, the takeaway from these two quotes is that not only is it important to identify and treat FH in the general population, it's important to identify and treat early on, particularly in childhood, so that outcomes are better. As genetic counselors, we aren't the ones primarily responsible for treatment and management of FH. Um, this will fall primarily under the responsibility of cardiologists and lipidologists, but it is important for us to briefly discuss them here. Obviously, the first line treatment for anyone with high cholesterol will be lifestyle modification, including diet and exercise changes. But for patients that have a confirmed diagnosis of FH um, by genetic testing, Lifestyle modifications alone will not be sufficient to bring cholesterol levels to an acceptable level. So medications that are effective in lowering cholesterol are statins, absorption inhibitors, bile acid sequestrants, and a new category of drugs known as PCSK9 inhibitors that have shown great promise in reducing the risk of coronary artery disease, particularly with patients for patients with FH. When to start screening? Recent guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics, National Lipid Association, the International FH Foundation, and others recommend screening for FH beginning at 5 to 10 years of age. In the U.S., recommendations involve universal screening of cholesterol levels by ages 9 to 11 years and by age 2 for children of parents with FH or a strong family history of premature coronary artery disease. Until very recently, no consensus of care was established regarding the utilization of genetic testing for FH, but this changed with the recent guidelines that were published by the American College of Cardiology. So what are some possible solutions to the underdiagnosis problem surrounding FH? Ask about cholesterol at your next routine visit. Know your family history and inform your healthcare providers of family history of sudden cardiac death or early coronary artery disease, particularly for any male family members at the less than 45 years of age, and for any female family members less than 55 years of age. Also, another possible tool to help identify more people that have FH in the population is a tool like the Sanford chip. So the Sanford chip is a screening test that includes screening of three out of the four genes known to be associated with FH. LDLR, APOB, and PCSK9. However, because this chip does not include every single known mutation to be associated with FH, it is not appropriate to rely on the chip for individuals that already have suspicious clinical or family history. Rather, the chip is designed just for the general population where there are no clear identifiable personal or family history red flags that stand out. So, in summary, FH is a major public health issue that is vastly underdiagnosed in the general population. Know your family history, particularly as it relates to early coronary artery disease, and please talk with your provider to get more information. Thank you.